All right. So, life in a leaf, the wonderful world of leaf miners. This talk is going to be all about leaf miners, which are um, insect larvae that live and feed between the epidermal layers of leaves. And uh, each leaf miner has a, or most of them have a very restricted set of host plants that they'll feed on. And each one uh, has a characteristic pattern that it makes as it mines through the leaf. And they have, each species has its own particular way of dealing with its frass and other little idiosyncrasies that together uh, with the, the identity of the host plant can often uh, make it possible to identify the insect uh, just based on, on that evidence without actually examining the, the insect itself. Uh, and I, as a, um, a, a generalist naturalist who, who does a lot of botanical work and um, in the past spent a lot of time um, tracking vertebrate animals, I, I became fascinated by this idea that you could track these tiny things and identify them by the signs they're leaving. So for the past decade, I've um, been putting together this complete guide to leaf miners of North America. And I've uh, spent a couple of years doing a massive literature review and traveled all over the US um, putting this together. And it, it exists just in digital form because there's I, I'm constantly learning new things and integrating them. And so I'm actually already halfway through putting out a second edition of this, which I'm sending out to subscribers uh, as PDFs uh, roughly once a month, although during the field season, I fall behind. <laughs> but uh, although I've uh, traveled all over uh, the continent looking for leaf miners, there's plenty to find uh, right in my own yard. And uh, this is what my yard looked like when I, uh, my wife and I bought our house in 2013 just uh, an empty lawn with an arborvitae hedge. And uh, the, the first thing we did was not mow the lawn for a few weeks and see what <laughs> wildflowers started popping up. And the very first thing to bloom was this daisy fleabane plant here, uh, Erigeron annuus. And when I saw it blooming, I ran over to see uh, what kinds of leaf mines I could find on it. And, there turned out to be mines of three different species just on this one individual plant. One was this a yellowish blotch mine that I recognized as the work of Herectopa plantaginicella. Uh, when Chambers named this moth, he mistook its host plant that he just had the basal leaves and he thought they were plantain leaves. And when he realized his error, uh, a few years later, he tried to rename it Correctiva originarella, but you're not allowed to do that. So the, the original name stuck. <laughs> um, but uh, the second miner I recognized as a fly. There are actually three agromyzid fly larvae mining in this one leaf. And I collected these to rear them to adults. And I got some. And I send all of my agromyzid flies to Owen Lonsdale in Canada, who does the dirty work of dissecting them and examining the genitalia to figure out exactly who they are. And this one turned out to be a new species. So the holotype is right from my front yard. Um, Phytomyza origeronis. We try to name most of the species I rear after their host plants. Um, and there was one other miner on this plant which had a totally different mine, that, uh, this elongate track along the um, petiole, and I had no idea what this was. So I collected it and stuck it in a vial and saw there was a little caterpillar inside that started enlarging this blotch mine in the leaf blade. And you can see the mine is totally clean. And that's because it was uh, piling all of its frass in this neat little heap just outside the mine entrance. And I was able to rear that to an adult and it is something in the Scrobopalpula diffluella complex, which is a, a horrible <laughs> group of, or the, this whole tribe, Norimoshimainai, is uh, very poorly known. And this may also be an undescribed species, but it will have to wait until someone wants to revise this group for me to be able to put a name on it. Um, so, uh, 
this is what my yard looked like again when I first bought the house. But um, since then, we've been, in addition to just not mowing the lawn, we've been uh, planting as many fruit trees and vegetable gardens and flower gardens as we can all around and just mowing uh, pathways winding all among that. So I'll show you a series of before and after shots here. This is another view of the front yard, some peach trees in the foreground, a little pawpaw patch just getting started there. Uh, the backyard now with rows of raspberries and a hoop house, asparagus, peaches. <laughs> um, and a, another a distant view of the front yard, all full of meadows and small apple trees. Um, the, the house came with this one old apple tree. We were just starting to build a chicken house there. Now a more elaborate chicken enclosure. And then a final view of the backyard and from inside the chicken enclosure. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you all these before and after shots of my yard is the whole rest of this talk is going to be um, leaf miners I found in my yard last year, because last year for a change, for reasons you can imagine, I didn't travel anywhere. I decided to just do a thorough uh, inventory of, of what's right in my yard. And I ended up finding 212 species of leaf miners, which included uh, nine species of sawflies in two different families, 14 species of beetles representing four families, 74 species of flies in four different families, and 113 moths from 18 different families. And so I'm going to I'll just show you the top 10 or so uh, most speciose families in my yard as a way of introducing you to the most, uh, most common families of leaf miners. So the winner was Agromyzidae with 61 species. Um, Agromyzids are little flies, just two or three millimeters long. The female have these conical ovipositor sh sheaths and piercing ovipositors that they use to insert their eggs uh, into their host plants. And uh, this is a backlit view of the beginning of a mine. You can see there are three eggs that were inserted into punctures and these three larvae hatched and started forming a common mine together. But then there are all these other punctures, which are also made by the female's ovipositor. And those, um, she was just poking the leaf so she could drink the juices uh, oozing from the wound. And that's a characteristic sign you can see around agromyzid mines to help you identify that they at least belong to that family. Uh, agromyzid larvae, like most uh, leaf mining fly larvae are they're legless. They have no uh, head capsule, and they have a pair of uh, posterior spiracular processes. And then when when they uh, like all the higher flies, when they um, are ready to pupate, rather than shedding the last larval skin, the the last larval skin hardens around them to form what's called a puparium. And the way the adult emerges from the puparium is this balloon pops out of its forehead. It's called the telinum. And then it, as it wriggles its way out of the puparium, that airbag is kind of puffing in and out. And then the, their wings are all curled up, but within a few minutes, they're fully extended. And then within a few hours, they're fully colored in and that telinum never comes out again for the rest of their life. Uh, so back to that uh, flea bane I showed you earlier. Um, th that uh, species that was, that the holotype came from my yard. It was still around last year, so I got to put it on my list. Um, just to give you a little more detail about how I knew these were agromyzid mines. Uh, the, the species that make linear mines have this characteristic pattern of an alternating frass trail. And that uh, comes out that way because uh, whereas all the other leaf mining orders, the larvae lie either on their bellies or on their backs, and they end up making a central frass line when they're making a linear mine. The agromyzid larvae 
lie on their sides and poop along the other side of the mine and then they roll over and poop over there so it goes back and forth like that. Um, and this particular species has a shiny black puparium, which is uh, typical of this the group of um, Asteraceae mining Phytomyza species that it belongs to. Um, and again, that's Phytomyza origeronis, uh, which Owen Lonsdale and I named in 2018. It's actually one of three species in that paper that had their holotypes come from my front yard. Uh, and all three of them were still in my yard last year. So this is the second one, Ophiomaya parda, which uh, mines leaves of asters in the genus Symphiotrichum. And it has this very distinctive frass pattern of these widely spaced spots that get bigger and more widely spaced as it mines along. And that, uh, Owen came up with the name parda, uh, which is the Latin name of a leopard, uh, referring to the spotted pattern. Um, and another uh, neat thing about this species is the mine seems to end right here, but if you flip over the leaf, you see that the larva kept mining uh, without feeding, I think. It's just kind of pushing its way a couple more centimeters um, just below the epidermis, and then it forms this robin's egg blue puparium inside the leaf. Uh, seems to always be right at the leaf margin. Uh, so that's the adult of Ophiomaya parda, and the third species from my yard is another Ophiomaya, looks almost exactly the same, Ophiomaya euthamii, which um, mines leaves of grass-leaved goldenrod, the genus euthamia, and it, it has the exact opposite uh, habits from Ophiomaya parda. It mostly mines on the lower side of the leaf, and then when it's almost mature, it switches to the upper side and mines a little bit, and then it makes a blackish puparium just beneath the upper epidermis. And uh, if you don't remember your high school uh, botany or whenever you last looked at a cross section of the inside of a leaf, um, this shows how a mine can be visible only on one leaf surface. The, the, the larvae are so skinny that they're mining in some cases, just in these epidermal cells, either just the upper or lower epidermis, or they may be only in the palisade mesophyll or only in the spongy mesophyll. So if they're only in one of these layers, they'll only be visible on one surface of the leaf. Whereas that, um, that norimushimine moth <laughs> that made the totally transparent mine in the fleabane leaf, that's uh, known as a full depth mine because it was consuming all of the mesophyll. Uh, so, so no green tissue left behind. Uh, and there, so those were the three species whose holotype types came from my front yard. There was also one where a paratype came from my front yard, Lyriomyza carfophori. Uh, I, I gave it that name because its first known host plant was uh, Carphophorus. Uh, that Tracy Feldman uh, reared it in North Carolina. But then I found the same species mining, mining a Biden's leaf in my yard. Um, plants in this genus are known as beggar ticks. Uh, and and this, on this host, at least, the species always starts right at the tip of the leaf, and then it makes this kind of coiled mine winding towards the base. Sometimes it's more stretched out like this, and sometimes it's really compact and intestine-like. Uh, and now some other species that I did not name, but were also in my yard, just to give you a, a sense of the diversity of agromyzid mines. Nemoramyza posticata, whose adult uh, males are recognizable by this white-tipped abdomen, um, makes this brownish kind of trumpet-shaped blotch mine on, on all sorts of plants in the aster family. They don't look like much in reflected light, but in uh, when, if you backlight the mine, you see this amazing herringbone pattern of what are basically uh, tooth marks, the, the larva's little mouth hooks scraping back and forth. Uh, Calicomyza promissa is another Asteraceae feeder, but this one is only on asters in the genus Symphiotrichum. Uh, the larva starts out making this greenish linear mine that when it hits the midrib, it, it starts to make a blotch that has these 
uh, finger-like lobes. It's known as a digitate mine. Uh, and then as it continues feeding, it, it gets closer to the upper epidermis and starts making a more whitish mine uh, that can sometimes occupy the entire leaf. So this is a later mine of the same species on the left here. And uh, my favorite thing about this species is uh, its pupation habits. Its puparium is formed inside the mine and it's always on this little narrow pedestal of frass, which I would love to see how it does that, but it's, it's always held elevated over the floor of the mine like that. A Japanagramiza virigula, a kind of a metallic greenish fly uh, that has a common name, the oak shot hole leaf miner. Its larvae mine in oak leaves. And uh, so here is where an egg was laid and a larva is just starting to mine. And then these other three holes here are where the uh, female was doing that host feeding, where she's just stabbing the leaf with her ovipositor and then drinking. And because um, she does this when the oak leaves are just beginning to expand in the, in the spring. Um, they end up stretching out and making these conspicuous holes where she was feeding. So this little white dot here is the actual puncture she made with her ovipositor. And then this brown thing is the necrotic disc uh, that's formed by that wound, which will eventually drop out. And then this a uh, white area is just the hole in the leaf that's stretching out. And here is uh, a couple of weeks later, they just really stretch out and it looks like the leaf's been shot full of holes. This is a more advanced mine with the larva still feeding and the stretched out over position hole. Um, so that's the adult again. And um, the species is a little mysterious because the, it, it seems to just have this one generation in the spring and then the adults emerge a few weeks later without any diapause. And it's, maybe they survive until the following spring to lay eggs. That seems, I don't know if, if any flies or adults are known to live that long, but I don't have a better explanation for what's going on with them. Uh, Agrimiza aristata is another species that's only active in the spring, but in this case, it has a pupil diapause that lasts from, say, May to the following April. And it uh, feeds in elm leaves. It almost always lays its egg right at the tip of a leaf serration, in this case, right at the tip of the leaf. Um, it starts out making a linear mine, then it becomes more blotchy. Allagromyza cornigera has the same life cycle, but on honeysuckle. A very distinctive mine with these uh, big dots of frass that are alternating back and forth. Agromyza princei um, feeds on black raspberry. Well, it's uh, officially known from a single male specimen that I reared in Connecticut. Uh, from black raspberry that I collected during a bio blitz um, in early June, and then the adult emerged the following spring. I named it Prince I after Prince because raspberry beret, <laughs> but that, this is what the mine of the holotype looked like, uh, and I found three mines, uh, including this one in my yard last year, and to me, I, I, I'm fairly confident this is the same species, and I actually got two adults emerged just a few weeks ago. Um, they were both females, so I don't know if Owen will be willing to say for sure it's the same species without seeing the male genitalia, but the host and the phenology and uh, the frass pattern, everything seems to match that species. So that's what I'm going with. <laughs> um, and one more agromyzid fly. This is an oregano leaf I found literally right outside my front door. Um, I wouldn't have even thought this was a leaf mine if I hadn't been trying to catalog every last leaf miner in my yard. It just looks like a randomly brown edge of a leaf. But when I flipped it over, I could just barely see this puparium peeking out a slit um, at the end of it, confirming that it was a mine. And over the next couple of weeks, I looked around and found some earlier examples where this was clearly a leaf mine. But the thing is, I looked in my book and there was no, uh, nothing known to mine in oregano leaves. 
I checked a European leaf miner website and there was something named Phytomyza oregonii uh, that occurs in Europe that makes mines exactly like this. And I was able to rear several adults and Owen recently confirmed that they are that species. So first North American record for this species uh, with, within a foot or so of my front door. All right, second family, uh, a gracilariid moths. I found 43 species in this family in my yard, including this one, Phylicnistus vitagenella, which is a grape leaf miner. It makes these very superficial linear mines that look just like snail trails almost. And, and these, it, it's, this is called an epidermal mine where it's feeding only in the epidermal cells and just slashing them open and drinking the liquid contents, but it's not actually consuming any tissue. This is the yellow larva right here. And this species always pupates, it, it pupates in the leaf, but always right at the edge and it causes a little fold or crimp to form over the pupa. Uh, whereas this species, Phylicnistus vitifoliella, uh, makes a deeper mine with a uh, dark frass line and it forms its pupil cells well away from the leaf margin. And there are no consistent differences in the adult's wing pattern and apparently uh, not in their genitalia either. And uh, Don Davis was planning to synonymize these species, but I was convinced because of the leaf mine differences that they were different species. And I recently got some DNA barcoding done and confirmed that they are two different species and that um, slightly different mines in the Western US are made by a third undescribed species, which maybe we'll be able to put a name on before too long. Uh, and all of these Phylicnistus species pupate uh, in cocoons at the ends of their mines and the, the pupa pokes out of the cocoon when the adult is ready to emerge. So this is just the pupal exuvia poking out. Uh, all species in the genus Cameraria form upper surface blotch mines, Cameraria guttafinitula um, on poison ivy. And uh, some Cameraria species make these distinctive circular silk chambers inside their mines in which the, the overwintering generation, the, uh, the larvae hang out in those and then pupate the following spring. Phelinarichter species uh, is a, a closely related genus, but they, almost all of them make underside mines. Um, Blancardella in apple leaves. And these are called underside tentiform mines because the, the larva starts out making a flat blotch mine, but then it spins silk back and forth inside the mine. And as the silk dries, it contracts and causes the lower epidermis to wrinkle and the upper epidermis to buckle and form this roomy tent that the larva can move around inside. Uh, makes it easier to get away from parasitoids trying to lay eggs in the larva while it's feeding. And um, as the mine deepens, the, the larva starts picking out little bits of the upper mesophyll, giving it the spotted appearance. And that's why this species has the common name of a uh, spotted tentiform leaf miner. But many other Philanerichter mines look just like this. So common names aren't really that useful for leaf miners in general. Uh, Peronyx is a very difficult genus. The, most of the species look pretty much like this. Uh, there are at least five species in North America on birches. Uh, this is one of them. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, Peronyx species likewise make uh, underside tentiform mines. This is the upper and lower surface of the same mine. But rather than pupating inside them like Phelanerichter species do, the larva exits the mine, here's its exit hole here, and then it moves to the edge of the leaf and starts folding it down with silk. There's the larva. Um, so they make these flat leaf folds that they then continue to feed inside as external feeders. Uh, Calyptilia species have a, a similar biology. Uh, Caleptilia serotonella is in cherry species, including 
um, Prunus serotina, black cherry. Uh, so this one is starting out making an epidermal mine on the lower surface. The larva is right in there. And then um, it's becoming tentiform, but the larva has actually already exited through a hole here. Um, so by the time it's folded over here completely, the larva has moved on to its next phase, which is instead of forming a leaf fold like Peronix does, the larvae form uh, these conical leaf rolls, and then they um, feed as tissue feeders inside of those. Um, Marmara is a genus that's mostly made up of stem miners, but there are a few leaf miners. And Marmara vibernella is a species I first found uh, while conducting a survey of gall makers and leaf miners of Nantucket, um, which I've has also taken up for the past 10 years. And that's actually what got me started writing the guide to leaf miners as I was finding all these things I couldn't identify. So I had to write a book to look them up in. Um, but it took me five years to work out the complete life cycle of Marmara vibernella. Um, and then uh, finally, I was able to rear three specimens and Don Davis helped me describe and name it. And then uh, I had never seen it in my yard until last year, it showed up on this viburnum that some bird had planted at the end, edge of my yard. Uh, so what the species does is the egg was laid right here. The larva makes this short epidermal mine and then it's, uh, it goes deeper in the leaf and it makes this long, very narrow mine that always ends up following the midrib down to the base of the leaf. In this case, for whatever reason, the larva turned around, mined a little bit more before continuing down the petiole. So here's the mine going down the petiole and into the stem, down and down the stem, and down and down. And in fact, the larva is still feeding uh, out in that viburnum in my yard. They um, they have a year-long life cycle, so that the egg is laid in July, and then they're, they're briefly leaf miners, but they feed as stem miners for uh, 10 months or so. And in, in most cases, this species, the stem mines end up being so um, deep in the bark that there's no external sign until the larva is ready to pupate, then it cuts out this uh, semicircular flap and spins its cocoon on the underside of that decorates it with a few little frothy bubbles that no one is quite sure what those are for. <laughs> um, and then the adult emerges in uh, ju late June or early July. And there are easily a hundred plus undescribed species in this genus. It's based on uh, all the different plants that mines have been found on. All right, next family is Neptaculidae um, with 27 species in my yard. Uh, th these are some of the smallest moths in the world. Most of them are just about two millimeters long. Stigmella quercipulchella is one of numerous species that feed on oak leaves. Most Stigmella species make entirely linear mines with a central frass line. Um, Virtually all of the eastern oak mining stigmellas have green larvae, but this species has a yellow larva, and its mine ends up much wider than uh, the other species' mines, um, three and a half millimeters or so at the end. And all stigmella species exit their mines, usually through a semicircular slit in either the upper or lower epidermis, and they spin these little fuzzy cocoons about the size of a sesame seed. Um, Ectoedemia is probably the next biggest genus of Neptaculidae, and rather than um, making entirely linear mines, most Ectoedemia species make linear blotch mines, so they start out making this narrow mine that suddenly widens into a, a blotchier pattern. Ectoedemia rubifoliella is on blackberry leaves. Um, on poplars, there are there's this one species, Ectoedemia populella, that lays its egg on the underside of the leaf blade, and then the larva mines down into the petiole and induces a gall there. And then in the same species group, the Ectoedemia populella group, 
there are a few species that do the opposite. They lay an egg on the petiole and the larva mines up the petiole into the base of the leaf. And there, um, the symbiotic Wolbachia bacteria in their frass uh, inhibits the, the tree from withdrawing the chlorophyll from the vicinity of, of the mine. So when the leaves turn yellow and fall in October or so, um, there's this green patch that remains around the tiny little mine of this larva. And so it does most of its feeding in that green patch after the leaf has turned yellow and fallen to the ground. So I picked this leaf up uh, in my driveway just after it had rained uh, some one day in October. This is what the mine looked like the day I collected it. And then a few days later, the larva has extended its mine. Uh, during the day, it, it hides in the petiole, so you can't see it. But this was at night, so it was actively feeding. And it's extending these two walls of frass with a clean chute that it can tunnel through back to its hiding place. And I was able to rear that larva um, to an adult this spring to confirm that it was Ectoidemia argyropeza, which is an introduced European species. I was hoping it would turn out to be this species, which is undescribed. I first found it just a mile down the road from my house, and its leaf mine is completely identical. But as you can see, the adult looks totally different. Um, and the only difference in its biology, as far as I can tell, is that the native undescribed species emerges as an adult, maybe a week later than the introduced species, uh, which gives the introduced species a leg up on getting all the best uh, egg laying sites, I guess. All right, uh, I think this is the only beetle family I'm talking about, the Chrysomelody, the leaf beetles. I found 10 species of miners in my yard. Um, and there are several different lineages of leaf mining leaf beetles, uh, one of which is the flea beetles, including the genus Dibolia, um, all species of which are on plants in the order Lamiales. Uh, most of the Western ones are on uh, penstemons, and most, most of them, the mines have never been described, and maybe no one has ever found them. Um, but the most common eastern species is Dibolia borealis on plantain. It's a native species that is adapted to feed on the um, European plantains um, that are common in everyone's yards. So the, uh, something that's different about the leaf mining beetles from all the, the other leaf mining orders is that the adults will feed on the leaves of the same host plants well, I guess that's not totally true. That the female agrimizid flies are poking uh, and drinking sap, but the, these are the only ones that the adults are actually consuming, like eating holes in leaves. Um, and and each species has its own particular feeding pattern, so you can use that as um, evidence to help identify mines in some cases. So the adult plantain flea beetles eat these little round uh, holes or windows in the leaves when they um, come out of hibernation in the spring. And then the larvae form these conspicuous brownish linear mines. And when they're young, they're kind of whitish, but as they get older, they turn bright yellow orange. And um, by the end of June or maybe beginning of July, they bore into the ground to pupate. And then a few weeks later, um, they emerge as adults, which eat for, a, a little while and then they lay low in the leaf litter until the following spring. Uh, and all of the other leaf mining chrysomelids I found in my yard are in this group known as the hispines. They used to be the subfamily hispiny, but now they're considered uh, a group within the tortoise beetle subfamily, the tribe Calipinae. Um, and they all have these kind of pointy little heads. Um, Sumatrosis inequalis is a species on uh, various plants in the aster family. Uh, and I keep finding new hosts for it. So I found this mine on Black-Eyed Susan in my yard, and I don't think it had been found on any Rudbeckia before. 
this mine uh, superficially looks a lot like that fly mine, uh, Nemoramiza posticata, I showed earlier. But I'm going to zoom in at, on the beginning here. And you can see this oval egg that rather than being inserted by an ovipositor, the, the female beetle chewed a little pit and then embedded the egg in that. This egg is also much bigger than a fly egg. Um, it's visible to the naked eye. And then at the wide end, you can see the larva feeding it away. It has a, a distinct head capsule, also thoracic legs, which you can't see in this picture. Uh, but the frass pattern is totally different. This uh, long stringy frass is characteristic of a lot of beetles. Um, Microropella species are also associated with uh, Asteraceae, uh, Excavata, I'm finding on goldenrod in my yard. And that with the um, his spines, a, a lot of them have are very particular about well where they'll put their eggs and what they do with them. So this species always lays its eggs singly at the edge of the leaf on the lower surface and coats it with this kind of soupy excrement. And then the larva uh, makes this circular patch where it deposits most of its frass and it ends up pupating in this um, blister-like chamber that's formed uh, over that pile of frass. Calipus bicolor, all of the Calipus species are associated with grasses, and this species is a specialist on the genus Dicanthelium, and it uh, neatly pushes all of its frass through little holes along the margin of the leaf. There you can see the thoracic legs of the larva. Okay, next family is the Anthemiidae. Um, these flies are much bigger than the agramizid flies. They're more like six or seven millimeters long. Um, the Pegomia species are mostly uh, found on the, the plant order Caryophyllales. Pegomia hyoscyami lays these beautiful reticulated eggs, but unfortunately does so on the undersides of spinach leaves. Um, <laughs> which it <laughs> uh, pretty well mines out and makes them inedible. Uh, so we leaves that look like this we feed to our chickens, but we try to um, constantly scan for eggs and pick and eat those leaves right away before they hatch. <laughs> but I'm going to show this same leaf backlit. You can see there are 10 or so larvae all feeding together. So as they get to be a centimeter long or so, that they will move into multiple leaves and uh, do a lot of damage. There's another genus of uh, anthemiidae that is entirely associated with ferns, Chirosia. There's at least one gall former in this genus, and there are stem or rachis borers, uh, but there's a group of species that are fern leaf miners, including Chirosia phyllisis, which is on um, interrupted and cinnamon ferns. And this is what the uh, <clears throat> um, mature larva of uh, Chirosia phyllisis looks like, or one of the anthemians, I think it was that one. So this is the head on the left. Uh, Tenthridinidae is the sawfly family that includes all of the leaf mining sawflies in the world except for one. Um, the genus Metalus is found on Rosaceae, Metalus raueri on um, Blackberry. And it, it makes uh, trumpet shaped mines, so they start out narrow and widen into blotches. And you can often spot them because the Blackberry leaves develop this reddish discoloration along the sides of the mine. And the sawfly larvae feeds. Uh, belly up, so you can see there um, they have these distinctive thoracic plates that vary in size and shape and configuration depending on the species. And sawfly frass is pretty much always um, copious and in compact oblong pellets like this. And uh, mature sawfly larvae or prepupae pop out of the leaves and burrow into the ground. And um, many of them have a single generation. So they overwinter as prepupae and then um, 
pupate in the spring. Tishereidae is, uh, this family is known as the trumpet leaf miner moths uh, because the, again, many of them make trumpet shaped mines. Um, Coptotrichis citrina panella is on oak leaves and it makes these uh, elongate, narrow, wrinkled upper surface mines always along the margins of oak leaves. And they're, uh, most tishereids have clean mines because they expel all the frass from a little hole at one end, which is over here, but you can't see it. Coptotrichy malifoliella is on apple leaves. And this one likewise expels all its frass, but it also uh, decorates the ceiling of its mine with, I'm not sure what, it, if it just hasn't completely consumed the, the upper mesophyll here, but then it um, etches these little white crescents. And this is another uh, stigmella over here, incidentally. But the complete mine of Coptotrichy malifoliella, um, you can still see the white crescents there, but then they're kind of these well, alternating brown and white crescents speckling all across the surface of the mine. And this is another family that pupates inside the mine, and then the pupil exuviae left uh, protruding from the mine when the adult emerges. Uh, this is another good example of a trumpet shaped mine. This is the other species around here that um, decorates the ceiling of its mine with crescents. Coptotrichy castaniella, too many vowels there. It's on both chestnut and oak. Uh, this is one of my favorites, Tisharia corsatella. Um, it, this is another species that expels all its frass from the mine. So what this purplish stuff that it's smearing all over the ceiling of its mine is not totally clear to me, but it also makes this white a uh, circular chamber that it, the larva uses as a retreat when it's not feeding and then it ultimately pupates in there. Uh, also on oak leaves, if I didn't say that. Heliozelidae is um, right up there with Nepticulidae for uh, being among the smallest moths in the world. The other uh, species is about two and a half millimeters long, Coptodisca splendoriferella. The heliozelids are known as shield bearer moths because the larvae, when they're mature, um, cut out little oval pieces from the ends of their minds that they then wear as shields. Uh, this one is in a black cherry leaf. And they drop down uh, wearing this leaf piece um, from a thin strand of silk. This was dangling right over my driveway. Um, and when they hit the ground or a branch or something, they walk along for a little while, dragging this leaf piece behind them and uh, wearing it like a turtle shell, really. And then they um, attach it with a little button of silk to a tree trunk or some other convenient substrate, and it becomes their cocoon. Coleophoridae are the case bearers. I found five species of these in my yard. Um, and these are called case bearers because they all have a portable case that they carry around with them, not just uh, looking for a pupation site, but for their whole lives, uh, even as they're feeding and mining. So Coleophora crotata costella is in blackberry leaves. And some of them make their cases entirely out of silk, but many of them uh, incorporate pieces of their leaf mines and this one even has a little thorn from the blackberry leaf as part of its case. And they make these characteristic uh, full depth blotch mines that always have a circular hole in the lower surface, which is where the larva has attached its case and chewed in to mine as far as it can reach in every direction from the mouth of its case. So this is a larva of Coleophora comptoniella on the underside of a black birch leaf in my yard and um, the larva's head is extended into the leaf here, which you can see more clearly in this backlit photo. So this white area is where it is already mined out. And then that's, you can see the larva inside its case. And the, these mines are always totally clean because uh, whenever the larva has to go, it backs up to the rear end of its case and deposits all of its frass out that end. 
So this um, birch leaf here shows these have uh, each species has its own uh, particular way of constructing its case, um, and and this leaf here uh, tells the story of what um, Coleophora comptoniella does in its early instars. So this is the upper surface of the leaf. This is the lower surface, and I'll zoom in on different pieces to narrate this. So the egg was laid over here, and the larva mined out this little, maybe two millimeter long area, and then cut out the whole mined portion. And wearing, again, wearing that like a turtle shell, it walked over here, mined a little bit, walked over here, mined a little bit, over here. And then over here, it attached its case and abandoned it to make a larger mine that it then cut out a new case from. And it mined a bunch more and walked to the base of the leaf, where it then attached and abandoned that case and cut out a larger, uh, uh, made another mine and then cut all of that out to make its third case, which it is now walking around with. There's its head and legs extended. And it wasn't quite able to mine into the leaf serration, so those are still green. So here is the leaf again with uh, where the the first case was cut out here, the second one here, the third one here, and there's the larva walking around in its case. And uh, this is one of two species I found um, on a single black birch branch at the edge of my yard. This species has a bivalved opening at the tip of its case in contrast with Coleophora serratella, which has a trivalved opening. So there are little differences in the case architecture that can help you distinguish these species. But the mines themselves without the cases are going to be indistinguishable when there are multiple species on the same host plants. Um, almost to the end here. This is Bucolatricity, which all of the species are in the genus Bucolatrix. I found five of them in my yard. Um, Bucolatrix angustata is on asters and goldenrods. And it starts out making a very long, narrow, linear mine. And most Bucolatrix species exit their initial mine and then feed for the rest of their lives as external feeders. Um, on, on one side of the leaf. But this species uh, exits its first mine and moves into another leaf and makes, uh, continues to, to make mines, but more blotchy ones. This is another example of later mines of that species um, as seen from above and below, some blotchy ones and some more elongate ones. And this, um, genus Bucolatrix, they're known as the ribbed cocoon maker moths because they make these elaborate longitudinally ribbed pupation cocoons. Um, and many of the species before spinning that cocoon will make this palisade of um, vertical silk strands. This one is kind of fragmented, but sometimes it's a perfect ring that delineates the area where they're going to spin this cocoon. And that protects them from ants, apparently, while they're uh, taking plenty of time to spin this elaborate cocoon. Uh, so those were the top 10. And then just one extra family here, Gelichiidae, um, to uh, give me a chance to mention that there are also leaf miners on conifers. Uh, this genus Coleotechnites has many species on uh, pines and spruces and other conifers. In this case, Coleotechnites thuya ella um, on the arborvitae hedge uh, that came with my house. <laughs> um, so this is what a mine looks like in reflected light. It just looks like a, a brown tipped leaf. But if you backlight it, you can see the larva feeding inside. Uh, this is another species that expels all of its frass from the mine. There's a little bit of frass in the tip there. Um, but that, together with the fact that this larva is brown instead of green, identifies it as that particular species among the half dozen or so um, thuya leaf miners. There are actually three, of, three different species I found in my hedge. Um, so even with a lawn like this, there were at least three leaf mining species <laughs> that came with my house, I guess. But, um, 
if you want to have over 200 leaf liner species in your yard, you definitely want your yard to look more like this. <laughs> um, and if you're thinking, uh, well, I'm in California and my yard doesn't look anything like that. I want to know about the leaf miners in my yard. Um, starting next Thursday, I'm going to be teaching a five-week online seminar, Leaf and Stem Mining Insects of the Southern USA. And Southern is anywhere where spring is far enough along that there are leaf miners to be found. <laughs> um, and if you want more information about that or want to contact me for any other reason, you can find me on my website or my blog, or on Twitter. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Candice, question? Hey. Oh, I was meaning, I was meaning to oh, uh, clap, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question anyway. Um, so if you find a leak, you find leaves do you are you keeping the leaves inside to be able to take pictures over time and how do you take care of them in between yeah so for most leaf miners i just stick the leaves in the little plastic vials or tubes that uh, people collect insects in and that's that's generally sufficient to keep the leaf from drying out sometimes depending on the leaf that the kind of leaf you might need to add like a crumpled up piece of toilet paper with a few drops of water to keep it hydrated or something. But yeah, and then I can pull the leaf out from time to time to get pictures of its progress. Other questions? Question. No, about the stem miners. What about stem miners? Are, are those, those leaves more likely to fall off once a, a miner go, goes through the stem? Uh, not in, those marmora species are, are really, um, they're epidermal miners, so they're not really consuming the tissue, they're just kind of, um, they're just slashing through the cells, so they're not really doing much structural damage, they're, they're just in one cell layer. Uh, there may, there are probably some, some other things that, that, that mine from leaves into stems that might cause more damage, but for the most part, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Um, and um, I guess they're like little factoids that, you know, you had a lot of cool little factoids, a <laughs> <laughs> uh, lot of fun stuff. And the two that struck me the most, um, I'll start with the Wolbachia one. Um, so um, Wolbachia seems to be, I'd never heard of Wolbachia um, interfacing with the plant. So it's it's kind of um, disarming the plant's hypersensitive response to maintain the plant as a nutritious um, source for the, the miner, I guess, if I get it right. And so, you know, I've known about that from some like green islands and sudden oak death lesions on bay trees and stuff like that. Uh, but I hadn't heard of Wolbachia doing that. Is that a widespread thing? It, it's just, there have been several papers about this just in the past five or ten years, and mm -hmm. it's uh, mostly actually been um, the, the species that has been studied is Philanerichter blancardella, that spotted tentiform apple leaf miner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if, if you Google Wolbachia and Green Islands, you'll find five or ten papers on that topic. That's cool. I got to look that up. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is you had a miner that made a gall. Um, and I wondered how, is that something that's been investigated a lot in terms of like the evolution of gall formation? Is it something that seems to happen a lot? Or, you know, I, I, I've heard of leaf rollers progressing to gallers, but I haven't heard of a miner that makes a gall. Yeah, I, th I think there are many pathways to becoming a gall maker, and there there are a few other examples of like that genus Calyptilia, where most of them are, start out as miners and then become leaf rollers. There's one species that forms a stem gall instead, and that some of the Bucolatrix species are gall formers. Um, 
there are several other scattered examples. There, there was one recent paper on a, I was a gracilariate, I don't remember the genus, but uh, investigating the, the callus tissue that forms in the leaf mine um, as kind of a, a proto gull. But yeah, it seems like people are just starting to look in, in more detail into that. Thank you. Really great stuff. Thanks. Um, I had a question. I, you talked about um, seeing different species on the same um, plants or leaves and just wondering, do you notice that um, it's most of the time when there's multiple species on a singular leaf that they have different behavioral preferences or um, do you see a lot of conflict and um, or just like how do they manage if you know different species are interacting or conflicting with each other? Yeah, so there are definitely, um, there's differentiation like uh, upper surface versus lower surface and different phenology. Um, and but, but in, in some cases that there is direct um, similar minds on, on the same leaves that are bumping into each other. But there are definitely, like on oaks, there are over 150 different uh, oak leaf mining species, um, so you can you can spend a lot of time time trying to sort all of those out, but yeah, somehow they they manage. <laughs> I remember you mentioned that the um, in certain situations maybe the behavior of the miner as it gets older is a response to. Uh, or at least helps to protect it from getting attacked by parasitoids. Do you have any more insights on, on, on how these leaf miners protect themselves from parasitoids? It seems like they're almost sitting ducks for a paras parasitoid that can, yeah. has ovipods are long enough. Yeah, it seems like for the most part, they're pretty much trapped and helpless. <laughs> Those tentiform mines are one uh, one definite adaptation. Another, I think that the example of the, the agromyzids that will switch to the lower surface and hide their puparium there, I, I think that must uh, be some kind of defense against parasitoids. Although I don't know how much it really helps because from what I've read, the parasitoids start by detecting the, the kind of smelling chemically of uh, the, what's coming off of the plants that there's, there's some herbivory and then they're, when they find the right plant, they're visually scanning for leaf mines. And then when they land on the mine, they're feeling the vibrations of the feeding larva or hearing feeling the vibrations. And so it seems like the fact that the larva is on the underside of the leaf isn't going to protect it that much in that case. Um, but once it's a puparium, it, I guess they can't really feel its vibration. So it, yeah, those are the two main uh, Things I've found. I mean, in, in a blotch mine, a larva is able to wriggle around in all different directions and try to escape a, a parasitoid that way. So that's, I think, a blotch versus a linear mine is you know, probably an adaptation to avoiding parasites as well. I, I guess just one other follow up question Have you reared a lot of parasitoids? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, probably half of the insects I rear from leaf miners are parasitoids. Um, I, uh, I'm nearly done with a paper. I sent all of my eulophid wasps at one point to Krister Hansen, um, and he's identified them all. But he's, there's one more batch that's waiting in the British Museum, uh, the Natural History Museum, for, which has been closed for the past year. But as soon as he can get those back, he'll identify that last batch, and then we'll have a monstrous paper uh, documenting all these new host records. And I've got piles of braconids and other things waiting, teramolids waiting for someone who wants to identify them. <laughs> Great, wonderful, thank you, thank you. I see that there are a bunch of chats, which I haven't, I've seen a few of them go by, but I don't know if there are more questions for me in there. Yeah, um, Charlie, I got a, question um 
uh, first fantastic talk, and I, I use your book all the time for identifying um, uh, leaf mines we get here at the CDFA in California. So it's very, very useful. And um, can you can you say a little bit how you photograph the these tiny, tiny adults of the leaf miners? Uh, what what's your setup uh, at home? And uh, and a second question. Um, you work mainly on North America, but I was wondering if you have any insight uh, worldwide. Are uh, leaf miners more common in the tropics than in, in northern areas, or is there no correlation? Because like sawflies are much more abundant or species rich in the north than in the tropics. And uh, is there a similar tendency or, or don't we know at all anything about that? All right, well, I'll answer the second question first. I, th I think there are probably a lot more in the tropics. I haven't studied them much, but I know just for instance, uh, Dave Wagner and Don Davis found just at one biological station in Costa Rica, I think they found mines of like a hundred different phylicnistus species. Um, and there are, I don't, there are maybe 20 species in North America. So yeah, and I, I think there are hundreds and hundreds of undescribed species in the tropics. Um, and as to my setup, I so I chill all of my reared adults um, overnight in the fridge, and then I put them on this, I don't know if you can see this, but it's just a yeah, white yeah. dinner plate that I stick <laughs> in this big plastic bag. And then uh, I stick the business end of my camera into the plastic bag. So just in case the, the uh -huh. bugs start to wake up and fly around, I can cinch shut the plastic bag. But this is a, a Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens, which is not good for much other than taking pictures of adult leaf miners. I mean, the match, maximum field of view is 22 millimeters and the working yeah. distance is a couple of inches. Um, and you need this twin light flash to bombard the subject with light. But it, it's great for that, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, very nice. I, I, I like your setup because you can take the dinner plate and the plastic bag in the field or when you go somewhere, you, you can always have it with you. So it's not a, not a complicated setup. Right, yeah. Excellent, because I, I always admired your, your pictures. They are very detailed. And I know how difficult it is to have these tiny, sometimes nervous insects running around and they lost, you lo lose them very easily. For sure. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> At some point in the last month, there was a, a short YouTube video um, by a public radio called KQED. They have a series called Deep Look, where they filmed some leaf miners like crawling in a leaf, and they oh, are very, they're really good at, at detailed photography. And that's a really good little video that they made. Yeah, that was um, I think it was Scaptomyza flava. It's a, a mustard leaf miner that's found all over North America. But yeah, that was a really neat. I haven't really done any video except I, I, I don't have video on my camera, but my wife has a Canon that has <clears throat> a video. And I, just one time when I had flies just emerging from Pupuria, I tried, I put my lens on her camera and got this kind of grainy black and white video of the Tilinum puffing out. Um, and I have a few, Google uh, balloon faced flies, you'll find my blog post that shows that video. But I would love to do more with that at some point. But the, just organizing all the photos keeps me pretty busy <laughs> without dealing with editing videos and stuff. Well, Thank you very much for coming to our meeting. And I was every every next slide that you showed and every little story about how the insect moved was just like mind blowing each time. It's so detailed and so wonderful. And it's like all this stuff is going on right outside our door, you know, so yeah. Yeah, and then, um, well, I don't know how many of you are actually in California, but maybe most of you, but <laughs> there's, there is so much uh, left to be found there. I mean, there are real, I've, I have a, an iNaturalist project called Leaf Miners of North America, where people have been adding leaf mine photos. And there's 
things that just people are seeing all the time in California that are just totally unknown species. And I, that's something I, I've been, uh, as I work through and make the second edition of my book, I've been compiling a spreadsheet of mystery mines that, including what state they're found in and what month larvae have been found to try to encourage people to pursue these mysteries and try to rear them. But I mean, that's really true everywhere. I mean, you saw I've found multiple new species in my own front yard, but if um, the further you get from New England, the more <laughs> new things there are to find. So, yeah. And Charlie, along those lines, you know, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges is finding an active leaf mine, because uh, how many times do you come across a leaf and it's already been you know, evacuated? Mm -hmm. And I guess the great advantage to the pandemic for you is being able to do this all in your backyard and be able to check them every day. Yeah, that <laughs> helped a lot for sure. But yeah, after if you keep at it, you definitely develop a search image for what a fresher mine looks like. Like they tend to be greenish and a little less conspicuous than the vacated mines. So that'll be more uh, darker and browner. But yeah, looking earlier in the season helps because you have a, a blank slate and anything you see if you're looking regularly is going to be something fresh and probably occupied. All right. <laughs> Does anybody want to say anything or uh, ask one more question or one more announcement before we go? Yeah, Charlie, you should definitely come by California. So there, there will be a lot of people who will happy, be happy to host you, to drive you around, show you stuff. I mean, it's definitely worth a, um, a few weeks <laughs> spending here. Uh, that would be, would be great when the pandemic is over. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been there. I've been on two uh, leaf miner uh, voyages through California, uh, but it's been I think the most recent time was in, when was the last super bloom in at Anza Borrego? That was 2017, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was there just for a week. Um, and everything I found in the desert was new to science pretty much. <laughs> yeah, there's some nice places in the mountains to look too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the first time when I was just getting started, my wife and I had drove around the country uh, for two and a half months and kind of all around the perimeter. So it was um, hit some mountains and all different bioregions that time. It's a little, I wasn't as good at rearing then. If I had, if I took that trip now, I would end up with a lot more reared adults. But always more to find. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to come share your work with us. My pleasure. Thanks, bye everybody, bye. for listening. Bye bye and thanks. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>